Today, in partnership with Sagat, we are privileged to have Hugh Atchison. Hugh Atchison is the chef and partner of four restaurants in Georgia, Five and Ten, The National, Empire State South, and The Florence. In 2010, Hugh competed on Bravo's Top Chef Masters Season 3, and he returned to the hit show as a judge starting in Season 9. Hugh won the James Beard Award for Best Chef Southeast in 2012, and most recently he released his third cookbook, The Broad Fork, which he'll be showing us a couple of recipes from today. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Hugh Atchison. Bonjour. <laughs> so, I'm Canadian, hence is my denim on denim look today. <laughs> The Canadian tuxedo. I am wearing khakis, though, so I didn't complete the outfit. Um, OK, we're going to make two things. Now, this book is really meant to be, it literally came about as an answer to somebody down the street when I was picking up my CSA box in Athens, Georgia, on this beautiful historic street that we live on, walked down in a quintessentially American moment you know, with my two daughters, our hair flowing in the winds, and we pick up. Our CSA box, because it's what we're good, supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be cooking from scratch, and it's goodness. And there was this one annoying professorial guy, because it's a college town, and they lurk on corners. <laughs> and he was like, what the hell do I do with kohlrabi? And he'd ask me questions like this every week. And I was like, dude, lay off. Um, <laughs> It's just because I am I'm the mental of chefdom in Athens, Georgia, they come to me and ask me these questions, and it was you know ongoing and nonstop. But it got me thinking that nobody actually knows what to do with kohlrabi, um, <laughs> and nobody knows what to do with a lot of vegetables. Or as Americans in our kitchens, we cook like this. We cook the things we know, the things that our parents taught us, the things maybe our grandparents taught us, uh, the things from our community, the things from maybe our uh, heritage past and those are the recipes we know and understand and we often don't break them down even though we're surrounded by great food and you guys eat out all the time and eat great food where rarely do you go out and actually try and cook something new um, so it's meant to sort of pull the blinders off and just cook four to five recipes for one single ingredient so it goes through pretty much the whole list of everything I would have gotten in that CSA box in a full year some of the things you will not experience even in California, some of them you will definitely experience. If we were in Wisconsin, it would be different. Um, but here we are. So first we're gonna do a really simple salad with purslane, which is either, sometimes is farmed and sometimes is foraged, but it looks like this and it's a succulent. Um, and it's kind of got a nice bitter sourness to it as a green. Um, and then there's cantaloupe, and there's prosciutto. You could use really good prosciutto de Parma, um, or you could use whatever um, uh, fine deli meats you could find uh, in the salad. We're going to make a vinaigrette with that. But starting off, we're going to take a sweet onion. And I've peeled it, but you can see that the core uh, part of where it was attached to the root and then going to into Im immersed into the ground. And then the, greens, the ground level will be right here, and the greens coming up. This is where the actual root stem was, and that's going to keep it kind of attached as we cut down. So I peeled it, and then I'm just going to cut um, down with a pretty sharp knife uh, and kind of keep them together. And that'll just aid in the cookery of it. So we're going to add a little bit of butter to the pan. This pan's on medium heat. Um, because, and I'm going to jack it up just to meet, sort of medium, medium. Right now it's at four. I'm going to take it to five. This one does not go up to 11, which is the spinal tap reference for all of you over 40 in the room. Um, OK. Then we're going to take these and just uh, put them in here. And um, it's, it's a sensory thing. It's a flavor thing. But it's the best smell that you'll ever have in a kitchen, which is onions cooking in butter. OK, so we're going to continue that uh, just with a couple more slices. Again, this is, um, you know what? You want to work carefully with a knife, but um, I know this sounds contrary to, to logic, but you want your knives to be really sharp because um, the wound will be a lot cleaner. Um, <laughs> okay, so we're going to uh, process through some melon as that cooks. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this, we're going to caramelize pretty deeply, and for lack of time, I'm going to raise this up to 7 out of 10. Um, caramelize them pretty deeply so they've got a fair bit of color. 
I'll add seasoning in the form of a little bit of salt. So salt is not a spice. Salt is a flavor extractor. It pulls out liquid from your palate. It pulls out flavor out of food. And you're kind of looking for that synergy and maximization of the two. And if you use too much, it's gross. OK. So we're, we're going to take half of these and puree them in a blender. This is a Vitamix. It can puree. You can look online, and you guys can laugh as they puree Apple products on it. Um, <laughs> then we're, the other half we're going to reserve for the beauty of the salad and its integrity. Uh, so we'll have beautiful caramelized onions dotting through that. Um, and, but the other half is going to go in here. It's going to get pureed with some vinegar and some mustard, and then mounted with some olive oil to create a uh, emulsified vinaigrette. Uh, and meanwhile, as that goes, let me just stick this off to the side and start on recipe number two as we go. I've got an oven under here, and the oven set oven is at about 400 right now. And I'm going to put this on 7 out of 10, and we're just going to get some tomatoes roasting. Um, okay, these tomatoes. So everything kind of you want to work in seasons, but if you, if you want to work with tomatoes, and you're not in the season of summer, which is some tomato season, is I would buy Roma tomatoes because they're inherently seem to be the most uh, stable and sort of consistent tomato out there. They're not large and mealy and weird. Um, and they actually can concentrate their flavor really well by doing what we're about to do, which is roasting them. So you're going to get a little, rid of a lot of the superfluous uh, uh, liquid in them in favor of keeping the sugars behind. So I'm just going to cut off the top and cut them down lengthwise. And then we're going to get them in a pan and get them slathered with just a little bit of olive oil and some salt and pepper, fresh thyme, and garlic. Um, these, this, so this, this is thyme, right? OK. You bought the shaky thing of thyme six years ago? You should throw it away. <laughs> Herbs are leafy green things. Spices are barks and seeds. They differ a lot. But both are essential oils that are contained in them that give us the flavor. But if they sit around and dry out, they don't have as much flavor. There are definitely some uses for dried herbs, don't get me wrong, but not many. Like it's, and spices go stale as well. So you got excited about taco night eight years ago. The cumin is probably it's time to move on. So buy spices in small amounts and get rid of them and, or motor through them um, often. Uh, this is a clove of peeled garlic. If you buy pre-minced garlic, you are dead to me. <laughs> OK, good. Moving on. We're going to discard this. That's the good garbage. That's the bad garbage. OK. I'm going to put just a little bit of olive oil in the pan. And then we're going to put these in, just skin side, or they cut side up, skin side down. And then we're going to season just with a little bit of salt. I use kosher salt. What kind of kosher salt is this? Diamond crystal? Yep. So diamond crystal is the one we all use in restaurants. It just feels right. It's dorky, but if you use another type. And, and salt differs a lot. If you take Morton's kosher salt uh, and weigh, uh, weigh the amount that it takes to be a gram is far different from diamond crystal. So it just helps to get a solid reference point. OK, so the fresh thyme is going to go in there. And then I'm going to slather them with a lot of olive oil. The thyme's really just going to flavor it out. So I kind of want to beat it up as I'm sticking it in there. I'm looking over up these. And they're not burning. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And anyhow, in the modern school of chefry, burning stuff is cool. <laughs> so it's like everything's charred now. It's like, wow, who got really lazy? <laughs> um, I'm going to put a lot of olive oil over the top of them. That's just going to give it a lot of flavor. And I'm just going to bring that up to temp. I'm just going to bring the pan up hot. Normally, you could just stick it in a pan that's room temperature and get them in the oven. I'm just aiding this because it's a longer process than the 30 hours of quality time we have together. Um, OK, into the oven we go. And let's go back. What are you doing? <laughs> OK, nobody saw that, Hugh. Everything's fine. Um, I'm going to check on these. They're doing what they're supposed to do. Now, do you do notice that one of the things I'm not doing this is cooking is a matter of, it's of paying attention to the stove, but you do not have to be doing this all the time. <laughs> if you, I don't know why. My wife is always like, I'm like, what are you doing? So just let it go. It's caramelizing. It's doing its thing. Just let it mellow out and enjoy the time you're having with your onions. I'm going to turn it down to five. 
If you don't have a numeric system on your stove, you're not going to learn anything today. <laughs> so on top of all this, you're going to have to buy a new stove. This is going to be a really expensive free demonstration in a $10 book. Um, this is a melon. It is a cantaloupe. Um, it is its season uh, just beginning. We're in South, South Georgia, North Florida. We'd see them right now. I'm just going to cut down. Um, and any fruit that you would do if you're making orange supremes, it's the same thing. You're trying to create a flat surface by cutting off the top and the bottom, and then you're going around on it pretending like you're circuit making, you're cutting off the outer layer of the globe. Civilization is doing that by itself, but we're going to do this well. Okay, so all the way down, and I'm going to circle around. Sometimes you miss a little nubbin on the bottom, but I nailed it. <laughs> okay, down. I'm not. The, yeah, I am. Okay, then I'm going to scoop out the center seeds uh, just carefully. And that's about it. So, okay, let's talk about convenience items and stores and what you're doing wrong. Um, if you go and buy cubed cantaloupe, you pay about. You pay, you're paying somebody to do a lot of the work. You understand that, right? And I'm not saying your time is not more important than cubing cantaloupe, but if you buy crumbled feta, what is wrong with you? <laughs> Have you ever tried to crumble feta? It is not very challenging. Like it just literally crumbles within your fingers. <laughs> Yet it is a commodity product. That is amazing to me. Okay, I'm gonna cut some slices of this. You guys are like, this guy's weird. Um, first question. Smell it aromatically. It should smell ripe. It shouldn't be soft at all, uh, but it, it should have firmness to it, but not be rock solid. If you hear sloshing inside, it means that it's probably weirdly ripe inside. Um, so trust your gut. Or you like find like Curtis Stone in a grocery store. Do you remember that show he used to do where he used to like accost women in the grocery store and take them home and cook at their apartment? It was a really weird store. <laughs> Totally illegal in most states, but <laughs> but he's tall and Australian and beautiful. So, okay, I flip these over. They they look like that. Can you see that? Yeah. Mike, too. How are you doing? Mike, too. Okay. I don't know what that is. Stop that. Uh, I am just going to slice this down into uh, pieces that we're going to use in our salad. So just nice little thin slivers, um, and we're going to fold them around, and we'll go through making the salad. Come on in. Yeah, what's up with that? Oh, is it because the metal's on there? So this is an induction burner, which um, in, in chefdom, they're really frustrating devices. Um, uh, now you're good. Let's go to four. Got it. Uh, thank you. Okay, so the purslane is one of my major elements in this. It could be arugula. It could be, um, if you, any of you are into foraging, it could be a bunch of different cresses right now uh, that are in the marketplace. You can. Where did you guys buy this purslane? Uh, through one of our vendors. Nice. Okay. Um, okay, so that's pretty much done. I'm just going to turn that off. I'm just going to let that mellow out just a little bit. Um, so I'm just picking through. I'm going to pick, pick the leaves off. Um, literally, and back to the herb thing in California or where I'm from in Georgia, if you can't grow wind, mint, uh, you can't grow anything. So move into a condo, call it a day. Um, because mint is a weed. And so you should probably just grow it and then you can, I'm gonna send my kids to college on mint. <laughs> I'm gonna make them sell it. Um, so this is, we're just going through and picking the, uh, some of the bigger stocks off these and getting the nice pieces and avoiding the ones that aren't so nice. But purslane is really cool. You could use frise in this if you wanted to. I'm big into bitter greens right now. Frise and Radicchios and Trevisos and all those Italian ones. 
Okay, so we're motoring through that. We're going to make our vinaigrette in a second, and then we're going to jump back to cooking with fennel, because nobody knows what to do with fennel either. So I'll talk through fennel overall. So this recipe is appearing in the cantaloupe section, but it could just as well appear in the purslane section, which there actually really isn't a purslane section. Um, but purslane does appear in the book a lot. Uh, because I've got one waiter um, who's been with me a very, very long time who grows a lot of purslane, uh, Paul. So, yeah. Um, okay, so we're going to take these and we're going to use half of them in the beautiful salad and half of them are going to get pureed. So this is the morning moment that we cull the population from the beautiful ones. And they stay out and the other one gets blended up. It's a very strange totalitarian regime of cooking. Um, okay, that's going in there. And then uh, some vinegar is going in. Okay, so if you make a vinaigrette, what's a vinaigrette? Vinaigrette is a ratio, it's three to one. Uh, three to one what? Well, it's three to one oils. Um, and often olive oil, but it could be safflower oil or sunflower oil or a salad oil, depending on what type of flavors you want to bring to it. And then the one is the vinegar or acid. So that could be a combination of citrus juices or any vinegars. And the balance is the most basic vinaigrette you'll ever make. As you add other things like the onions, you're not really changing that ratio. You're just adding more flavor components to it. So with simple ratios like that, you can uh, make life much more convenient because you've now just avoided an entire aisle in the grocery store. Um, so that's the way cooking from scratch should work and uh, make you think about things. I have two kids. Uh, Beatrice is 13 now, but when she went off to kindergarten when she was five, I remember hearing this kerfuffle in the kitchen at six o'clock in the morning and she was making a vinaigrette. <laughs> <laughs> in a mason jar, because that's how we make them at home, is just put everything into a mason jar and shake it. And she had made this salad to go, and she's st standing on her stool making all this stuff, and at 6 o'clock in the morning, she's climbing around and making a mess, mess. But for years, she took her own, uh, she made her own uh, stuff to go to school. Now she's like, mm-mm, mm-mm, so, because she's 13, and that's what they do. Um, okay, I'm going to add a little bit of salt to this, and then we're going to start pureeing. So basically, in the emulsification process, you want to add this in relatively thin, if you add, or, or slowly. If you add it in really slowly, you're going to make a uh, onion mayonnaise. So don't go too slowly. And if you need to balance the thickness of it, you can stop and add more vinegar. You can also thin with water. Um, the, and don't be afraid to taste things as you're going along. This looks compostable. Nice. You guys as a uniform team are like, yes, go green. Um, okay. So that is, uh, pretty much done. The end result is, is looking like this. So we just, just made a really simple vinaigrette in a matter of a moment, and it's really not that hard to do. Um, because it's got that roasted allium flavor, which is the onion, it's really got a ton of flavor to it, so it's pretty versatile. It'll keep in the fridge for five, six, seven days. There's not really much perishable other than the butter and the onion that was cooked in there. Um, so the other things, I mean, obviously an oil is perishable, but it takes a much longer time for that to go uh, to a bad point. So, and when we say it'll stay good, it'll stay good in the fridge, obviously. So, Okay, so let's take all the other elements to it and lay them aside and we'll build our salad later and let's go through um, right now we'll just uh, start the other elements for the fennel salad so the fennel salad uh, is a salad with fennel so that's a whole bulb of fennel um, and then it's got hold on I ne need to put my garlic in with my tomatoes you're like man amateur this guy um, <laughs> Uh, we're just going to throw this in with the, you know, actually probably a good time. How are you? You're doing pretty good. There we go. 
and it's got anchovies in it. Usually they'd be Spanish white anchovies. These are uh, Italian salted anchovies, which are uh, flat guys. So we're just going to rinse them quite well, quite aggressively in cold water, and then pat them dry and then fold them into a salad at the end. Um, in this, we're going to shave the fennel by cutting off uh, the main bulb part. We're going to cut it in half and lightly core it. So I'm going to, and then we're going to, I saved some of the frond. Don't throw these away because either they're going to go in your chicken stock or you're going to dutifully mince them and make them into like a pickled chow chow. But y'all are busy, so maybe just the stock or hell, the compost pile. I don't know, <laughs> whatever you want to do. You're in your kitchen. I am not following you home like Curtis Stone in that creepy show. <laughs> okay, so I'm clipping the end off where its root was attached uh, uh, to it and it was in the soil. Um, and then if we see here, this is the core part uh, that is kind of a little firmer. So I'm just going to make a little V cut on that um, and cut off some of that, leaving still enough of it just like the onion uh, to hold it together. Then we're going to take a Ben Renner. Um, a lot of you guys work with your fingers in typing, so you don't. <laughs> You could use a knife for this if you want. But this is a Japanese mandolin, uh, and they're really ballistically sharp. Um, and uh, they probably account for more uh, cuts in the kitchen than pretty much anything. Um, and what we're doing is we're just going to slice it pretty thinly. I'm actually going to go just a little bit thinner than that. But there, they, it does come with a guard that will protect you, but it'll take like three hours to make what you want to make. So I don't use it. But we also, like when we come to a certain point to keep the integrity of our fingers, and God, these things, when they cut, they just like so cleanly and beautifully cut, and you're like bleeding everywhere. It's great. Um, <laughs> But it results in this, and uh, at the speed that I did that, it would take a long time for you to do um, with a knife. So it's, uh, it's just, it's very fast. So at uh, your con comfort, leisure, leisure level, I do not want you to cut yourselves. Okay, that's gonna go aside. I'm gonna do a little bit more on that. I hear all the, are you like, did he sign that release form? <laughs> Can I see it? Can we get a new copy of that, Hugh? <laughs> um, OK, I'm not going all the way down. Safety first. And then that's going to get scooped up and put in this dish. What we want to do in this point, at this point is kind of uh, get it macerating a little bit. So macerating is administering something like an acid or even a sugar if it was berries or something like that. In this case, it's going to be just fresh lemon juice. If you buy the plastic lemon with the, that says it's real lemon with a little copyright symbol, you are also dead to me. OK. So this is just going over. Um, also, in the, in, to help with the maceration, the process is going to be just a little bit of salt and then just a little bit of olive oil. And I'm just going to take really fancy culinary tweezers and mix them. Culinary tweezers, these were given to me by Albert Adria, um, who is Farron's brother, um, which if you ever go to Barcelona, he has an amazing restaurant called Tickets and just opened up another one. And he gave them to me, and he's like, he's like, just bestowed them on me, I was very excited. And then I realized that tweezers are a lot cheaper at the pet store. They're for, they're for deworming, but they are all, they're literally like the exact same things, and they cost $2 versus $25 at Cerro Tab. I'm like, man, what a racket. So, um, OK, so that's going to set aside. I'm going to take this uh, little bit of frond that I've got, which is the top leafy green. I'm just going to kind of tear it through. And that's going to give nice a little bit of color to our end result. And again, this is like, so, OK, this is two salads. But I think the modern realm of how we eat in America has totally changed. Um, and it's no longer a meat and potatoes world. So if you had this and some roasted tofu next to it and some brown rice and maybe another little salad element, to me, that's dinner. We all work a lot. We all do a lot of stuff. We work out. We're always running around. And 
you want to feel good, uh, and a 12 ounce steak or a massive thing is just not feel good food. It's once a month food now. It, it still exists, and I still want it. Not too often. I ate at Maroud last night. It was good. Um, that's that new Moroccan. I just wish it was more Moroccan. <laughs> but I'll write them a Yelp review, don't worry. <laughs> I have like 25 Yelp accounts. I just, <laughs> Stop. It's, uh, retribution. <laughs> so. um, okay. So, so the, again, this is going with those roasted tomatoes that we've got in the oven and these uh, anchovies, which is going to rinse pretty vigorously in the oven. How are you? What's going on? Nothing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so obviously uh, anchovies are preserved in salt, so uh, if you don't rinse them, then people are like, yeah, I don't like anchovies, they're really salty. And you're like, well, yeah, that's because you didn't rinse them. Um, but you can buy uh, bigger salt-packed anchovies from Italy, you can buy the ones like these which are salt-packed and then packed in oil, um, or you can buy Spanish like bocarones, uh, which are Again, cured in salt, but then uh, marinated in vinegar and olive oil, and are delicious. Delicious. Okay, what am I doing? I'm going to look in the oven. Seven minutes, 55 seconds. That's a hot oven. Remember that day you burned down Google, Hugh? <laughs> Hard to forget that one, honestly. Um, okay. The tomatoes look like that. The garlic went in at a perfect time. Um, <laughs> it is browned but not burnt. It is quintessentially done. It is exactly what I wanted, and I hope it's what you will like too. Um, we're going to plate this puppy up and get this going. Um, I'm going to take this bowl, and I'm going to take the fennel. And put it in there. I'm going to put the inch. Well, I'm sorry. Hold on. Thinking. Okay. Um, plating is however you want, you know. It's like, but, but that's what we do now. <laughs> it's minimalist. It's small. Your 26 other courses will be coming out soon. Um, so, but this is at home, so I'm going to actually plate it like somebody would actually want to eat it. Um, so, we're just going to lay some of this out. Um, I think that uh, food should kind of be, uh, have almost like a 3D-ness to it and be pretty and look good, but not overwrought. I don't, I don't think you need to. You guys know the Japanese concept of wabi-sabi? Sort of elegant disarray. Kind of work with that, meaning like if somebody doesn't like it, you can just stand back like a Japanese master going, whatever. <laughs> you don't understand my art. Um, so, I don't know why I'm doing one of the NPR songs as my humming thing. But. <laughs> Okay, and then the anchovies are going to go over. I'm going to get a little bit more of that frond in there. I'm going to add just a little bit of olive oil to this too. Um, if you wanted to, like if this, uh, there's another part of the book that's got pickled shrimp in it. And if you wanted to make a batch of pickled shrimp and then tuck them into this as a beautiful sort of side. And this is meant as a spread. This is, again, it's reactionary cooking to the farmer's market and what's there. So if you had other things in, I'm just trying to sort of, um, Ex take the blinders off and expand the horizons of what you're thinking about is, uh, is cooking at home with food and also making you realize it's really not as difficult as mo most people make it seem. Um, we have a vested interest in you guys still coming to restaurants, obviously, because it's how I pay my mortgage. But um, I, I want you to cook at home. I want you to realize that cooking is easy, but I don't know. None of you probably have kids. You're tech people. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. How many of us have kids? How many of you do, do you have kids? Nice, nice, good. Okay, Grand so, you know, I mean, grandkids, that's awesome. What are you, 40? 
Yeah. <laughs> so I think the important thing is the best time you will ever have in your life if you are a parent is cooking with your kids because it's multifold. You're teaching them life skills because at 20 years old, you remember all remember how hard it was. You're on your own. You're eating crappy food. You miss the Happy Meal, but they won't sell it to you anymore. The, this idea of how to feed ourselves and life skills and surround ourselves with basic cooking things, this food is not expensive to make at all. But it's good food. And if I can teach my kids, like Beatrice, again, shaking it at five years old, making vinaigrettes, if I can teach her also how to scramble an egg and make a perfect omelet and make a simple soup and roast a chicken, I'm done. I gave her enough that she can feed her and her six friends or her and her three families if she starts having babies soon. She's, she's going to be a deep shit if she does. Um, but this is the idea. But, but it, to me, I live in a community. It ain't my kids. It's everybody's kids who are around me. And if you then take the circles of community and make them bigger, it's everywhere. We've got a duty to make sure that the next generation has much more endowed life skills than we do. So that's the important thing. Let's uh, plate up this other one. OK, so this is, again, beautiful, uh, the beautiful onions. This is the prosciutto. So I'm going to get a little bit of that, that down. I'm going to take some of my purslane in my vinaigrette. I'm going to just put the dressing on the very top, because I don't want to wilt this purslane down too much. And then the onions go in. And I'm just going to kind of layer another bit of this. This is pretty. You don't have to have a fancy meat slicer at home. There's a batting cage, though, out back. <laughs> so there's probably a really nice meat slicer you can borrow somewhere. Um, Sergey was like, we need meat slicers. We need a whole room of meat slicers. I don't OK. Um, then I'm just kind of repeating this. And uh, then the onions are going on. The onions are so pretty, though. And onions, to me, are awesome flavor because they're cooked sugar. Onions are the way that everybody's like, how do I get my kids to eat vegetables? I'm like, feed them cooked onions and beets. When they're two years old, they'll never know what candy is because it's got so much sugar in there already. OK, um, so that's getting tucked in there. If you serve this with like a really good loaf of bread, um, eh, you're just expanding the idea of what dinner is. <laughs> Hold on one second. I need to address this. Look at that. I have one minute and 54 seconds. <laughs> you, guys, you guys are like, this guy's good. <laughs> Thank you. OK. Um, the vinaigrette's really beautiful. It's kind of puckeriness. I, I go on the side of um, I, I enjoy acid in food. I enjoy brightness in food. Um, I like that flavor. I think it's, it's sort of uh, bouncy to me and redolent and exciting. Um, I don't like uber rich flavors. Uh, so uh, the vinaigrette is probably more on the acidic side than a lot of people are used to. OK, we have a minute and 15 seconds for questions. OK. Chip. And then the cantaloupe goes on. Beautifully arranged, <laughs> just like that. <laughs> it helps to have somebody remind you about it before you get embarrassed in front of a crowd. <laughs> OK, uh, so there, that, uh, nice. OK, beautiful. Perfect, OK. Um, anybody have any real questions? That was a statement, not a question. <laughs> you can ask me questions. I'm turning this off. off. Nothing. What do you like to cook for your kids? Or what do they get really excited about if you're cooking? Um, steak. <laughs> but you know, to me, it's, a, it's like two big ribeyes for the four of us that are probably amount to four ounces of meat per, uh, per person. And I cook them on this little tiny, I've got this, what's called a, uh, what's it called? A lodge, like, Outdoorsman grill. That's just like a little tiny cast iron, all cast iron grill. That is awesomely cool and fun and inexpensive. But then next to it, there's like three different salads like this and wheat berries or they're big fans of farro. And, and it's just, it's a spread. And oftentimes we eat family style. So I'll just line up like, 
six platters of this stuff and we'll have sit on the counter and we'll have four empty plates and we'll just plate it up. You know, as a parent, I found that kids eat really well. This is going to put a lot of light bulbs above people's heads, but when they're hungry. So if they have a 5.30 snack and you're eating at 6.30, they're probably not really hungry. And that's when you see the vegetable pushing game off to the sides. So you got to make them hungry, so don't feed them. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, but just don't feed them a bunch of crap at 5.30 and you're going to have a better chance of feeding them well. So, but they eat anything. If I roast them a chicken and Carolina gold rice and old school country gravy and then next to that is escarole and beets and roasted carrots and peas, they'll eat all that. So, which is good. It's good. They're healthy kids. So besides deworming tweezers, what is your favorite mm -hmm. kitchen instrument and why? <laughs> Um, probably spoons. I mean, I know it sounds dorky, but we use spoons a lot. And, but we use them as spatulas. We use them as everything a lot. So um, they're versatile. But these are bigger than your standard spoon. This one's also slotted. Uh, so this, they're called Coons spoons. Um, but it's designed by a guy named Gray Coons, who's a really famous chef in New York, who was a chef at Les Binas at one time. Uh, but whatever. Um, and I like a Vitamix blender. They're just really powerful blenders. They're really handy for making smoothies in the morning and making vinaigrettes and make soups and purees and all that sort of stuff. Um, so they're good. I think investing in good pans is good, but you don't have to have to spend a lot of money. If you don't want to spend a lot of money on pans, buy cast iron, but you have to take care of it. And you have to watch a YouTube tutorial, um, which one of you probably has edited somewhere along the line, on um, taking care and refinishing cast iron pans because it's a lot different than what your grandmother told you. She was generally wrong. Um, OK, what else? Yes. Hey, Hugh, thanks for coming out. Well, thanks for having me. Um, what is the first recipe we should all try from Broad Fork? Hmm, you're in spring right now. There's a, if there's still asparagus in the market, there's an asparagus with piperad, poached eggs, and grits, which you could do, do polenta or whatever instead of the grits if you can't find them out here. That's great and really simple and really straightforward, but resonates with spring. It also resonates with you guys probably don't have much time off, but maybe you could do that on Sunday morning. So yeah, I'm thinking about you. What's your go-to anchovy brand these days? Go-to anchovy brand? Mm -hmm. I don't know. We buy them really large, large things. We cure our own, too. So I don't know. I mean, I've had great success with buying Spanish products on uh, Amazon. <laughs> I don't know why. I mean, I live in Athens, Georgia. I don't have many options. Uh, but I get a lot of like Ventresca canned tuna and stuff like that. I find it cheapest there. Um, so try one of those. I mean, look for a Galician brand. Um, one of those ones would be good. Your first book won a, a James Beard Award. Yeah. And I'm wondering about the role of writing in your life. I know you said earlier that you they do quite a bit of writing. And um, if this creative pursuit and that one sort of mesh together and... I think they do, yeah. Um, I never really th Somebody was like, you should do a cookbook. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I was like, man, that'll be easy. I've got all the recipes. And you have nothing. You, you really don't. I mean, I've got, I have systems of telling people what to do and basic recipes for restaurants. I don't have anything for home cooks. So when you're, when you're writing for a home cook, literally I get emails saying, you know, it said crack four eggs and use four eggs, but you didn't tell me to remove the shells. <laughs> so it's not like I'm saying I have to be instructing people that know absolutely nothing, but I have to, it's very wide spectrum. Um, but I like writing. I'm not very good at it. I dropped out of college. I come from a really super academic family, and I was the black sheep. And, but I like it, and it sort of tests me and drives me to do it more. And I think the only way you get good at writing is by writing. And you like write and write and rewrite and write. And you just have to do it. So you tell stories and narr narrative and anecdotes about food in an attempt to get people to fully understand what you're trying to get across. The how-to on recipes is the most difficult thing. It can be easy, but if it's easy, it usually doesn't really fully explain what you're having somebody do. And it's really hard. You know, if every book cookbook was animated with a little animated button off to the side, that would be great, but it's not. So, Hold on. 
Google is not on fire. There's just a little oil in the bottom. <laughs> okay. I have an issue where vegetables go bad. Like I'll buy a ton uh -huh. at once. What are good like staple veggies or like the most versatile vegetable to have? Carrots. I think yeah. You so people buy a lot more than they need, but buying really small amounts is crazy, stupid, expensive. Sometimes, sometimes now there are those groups like Blue Apron and all these little prep companies that give deliver you a stupid prepped. And I don't want you to do that. It's just silly and overpriced, but. If one of your spouses owns that company, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I think that staples in my fridge that aren't going to go bad very quickly are going to be carrots, onions, celery, obviously. These are main core of a lot of French cooking. Fennel. Um, I usually always have button mushrooms. It's something as simple as button mushrooms. And then the rest of it is from the market and from the farmer's market on Saturday, I buy some things. How you store it's really important. Ziploc bags with the moist uh, paper towel inside is going to keep lettuces a lot longer or arugula a lot longer than just standard shoving them in your regular part of your fridge. The crisper drawer is there for a reason though. It's kind of a humidity controlled area um, and will keep things from drying out more, more than anything. Um, so I'm trying to think what other vegetables. I mean obviously root vegetables are going to have a long time to them. Um, any leafy frilly stuff you just have to use. But that's the other thing. If you buy something it's like the way we consume anything. It's like if you don't have a real purpose for it, don't buy it. You need to be thinking about what you're doing. But that's the challenge of the CSA box is that you get the stuff and you don't have a choice. So you better love lettuce. Um, I heard through the rumor mill, actually I read an online article that you're opening a coffee bar in Pont City Market, which I is am. super cool. So I was yeah. just wondering like, what drove you to- I heard through the rumor mill that you guys are opening up an office there. Is that true? <laughs> maybe, maybe not. <laughs> Unconfirmed. <laughs> Unconfirmed. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I'd love to hear yeah, about that. Yeah, so um, I guess when I opened up Empire State South, which is our big restaurant in Atlanta, I was like, man, a lot of people were doing restaurants, this was five years ago, and sort of mixology was becoming the thing again and whatever. But I kept thinking, you know, a lot of people aren't really doing the bookends of a meal. They're not really paying attention to great beverage program at the beginning of your meal when you sit down before you get food. And then they're definitely not thinking about coffee because they don't care about coffee because coffee doesn't make them any money. So I was like, well, I care about coffee because I love coffee. And I was like, what if we did a really elaborate, really good coffee program? So we put one in Empire, and it was a really big success. It probably doesn't make that much money still, uh, but um, it's been worth it, and it's gathered a lot of acclaim. I have one guy there named Dale Donche, and Dale's a, uh, in this wonderful world of third rail coffee and third rail restaurants and all this DIY culture, it's just a lot of people nerding out on single topics, and Dale's just this classic coffee nerd, and he just knows a ton about coffee, and he's a great guy. He's a really good leader. So he and I are starting a restaurant, which is a massive kiosk. I'm trying to think what else. Was, oh, I went to uh, what was that coffee shop I was at? Uh, uh, Sight Glass. Sight Glass. Sight Glass the other day. It's kind of like that setup, but if you if I didn't own everything else in the room. So it's just an island, and it's called Spiller Park, which is the old name of the Atlanta Crackers baseball team stadium that was on the site of where Pond City Market is. So it'll be open. It's a multi-roaster um, company until we start roasting our own beans, which is in about a year and a half. Um, so we'll be using you know, four barrel. And which there's roasters out here we love, but there are a lot of Canadian roasters we love. Who's a coffee nerd in here? Anybody? 49th Parallel, which is great, uh, which is from Vancouver. Phil and Sebastian from Calgary. Um, four barrel, Hart from Portland couple others. George Howell. So yeah, we're excited. That'll be open in... So Pont St. Market is the second largest brick edifice in North America, and it's the old Atlanta City Hall East, and before that was the Sears Distribution Center in Atlanta. It's this amazingly massive building that's very complex, and a lot of uh, tech companies and other stuff are moving in there. MailChimp's in there, a bunch of other groups, but then there's elaborate retail level with, you know, um, anthropology and crap like that. Nice. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, round of applause. <laughs>